when it comes to Laurel and our, our attempt at inclusivity, it's like, oh no, there's no advantage there, that this is okay. What is up CrossFitters? In today's video, I wanna to talk to you about some of the mental gymnastics that we see on display leading into the 2021 Tokyo Olympics. As many, if not all of you know, we were supposed to have the Olympics last year in 2020, but due to a virus of unspecified origins that has been delayed to this year, just as most of our lives have been delayed by this last year and a few months. Leading into the Olympics, I am excited to see the Olympic weightlifting. That's my main sport that I wanna watch. And I'm most excited to see Lasha, I'm not gonna say his last name because I'm gonna butcher it, from Georgia, crushing it in the male weightlifting perhaps even breaking the 500 kilogram total between the clean and jerk and snatch. But that leads into our second most favorite Olympic weightlifter, that being Laurel Hubbard, who I mentioned in one of my previous videos talking about the transgender debate in sports. And Laurel Hubbard is actually going to be competing for New Zealand amongst biologically born females as the first transgender or at least first openly transgender athlete. This debate or this question over whether or not this she has an unfair advantage over her competition uh, definitely has sparked controversy. Currently there's actually a petition that has been signed by over 21,000 signatures to stop Laurel from competing against the biological women in Olympic weightlifting. Now as I stated in my previous video on the issue, one of the top things or top criteria that they use to determine whether or not you can compete as a transgender athlete amongst biological females is your testosterone levels. Uh, there's a 12 month period that you have to go through the appropriate testing, bring the testosterone levels down, taking the right medication, the right surgeries or, or all those, a combination of all those things. And if you hit all those markers, then you are deemed capable of competing on the same playing field as biological females. But what I notice about that testosterone debate is that it's not cut and dry. Just because your testosterone levels are dropped doesn't mean that you all of a sudden have lost all of the abilities and the foundation that you have built up over time from having been a biological male. In my previous video, I used the example of Pete Rubish, who was an elite level power lifter, or still is an elite level power lifter, who at the peak of his uh, drug use was putting up crazy, crazy weights. Then he got off the drugs and his natural testosterone levels have dropped down to levels actually below those of a biological female. Yesterday I pulled 633, um, 287 and a half kilos for four reps and I could have had five. So, I mean, I'm pretty happy that I can even pull that with 38 test levels, which are that of, the, of a female. Uh, so I think right now, honestly, I think I could pull 705. I think I could pull 320 kilos with 38 test levels. Um, but I think what I'll do, I'm gonna try to set a goal of getting to a 750 deadlift with uh, no testosterone in my body. Yet he's still able to go and deadlift seven to 800 pounds off the ground, which the vast, vast, vast majority of women are not able, biological women, no matter the size, are unable to do. I don't even know if it has been done. I don't know if a woman has deadlifted close to 800 pounds. If he were to transition and go into female powerlifting, he would absolutely obliterate the competition, despite the fact that his testosterone levels would actually be lower than those of a biological female. So the, the testosterone debate is, is one where it clearly does help, but you can still have lower levels, especially if you started off as a biological male and be able to put up crazy numbers because you've built up that foundation of bone density, of muscle strength, of power output, of conditioning over those decades, and it doesn't just disappear overnight. Now, Laurel has been transitioning for the last eight years, but that's still 35 years of male hormones and male development in that frame, in that physique, and in that strength and power. So while she won't be able to lift the weights that she did as a biological male, she would definitely still be able to lift crazy amounts of weight compared to her competitors. And she's still showing it. At 43, which if she were still competing as a male, at 43, you're probably not <laughs> gonna be even on the podium 
against the younger men, the, the ones in their 20s, late 20s and 30s, you're not gonna be even on the podium at 43 going up against these guys. And yet she's able to win many different competitions and will probably do pretty well unless she breaks her arm like she did in the last, uh, the other competition she was in. If she's able to stay healthy, she'll probably be able to podium if not win at 43, which is a tremendous age to be beating your competition at in professional sports, even though strength sports generally do are more advantageous as you get older and power sports too. But why this is interesting, why I find this, this fascinating with the story of Laurel and why people are kind of like, well, there's no advantage there, the, the, despite the, the base being built, is that conversely, we have this case of two Namibian sprinters who have been banned from their, their running, their 400 meter events, because their testosterone levels were, were too high. They took a blood test and their natural levels came back too high relative to their biological female com competition. And this also, the same rule, the same high, highly elevated testosterone levels has also stopped another South African runner from being able, and a, a previous uh, gold medalist, uh, Castor Semenya, from competing too, because of this rule of this higher level of testosterone. So I wanted to know a little bit more about Castor Semenya's case. So I just did a quick research or a quick look up on Wikipedia about her. And it turns out that due to some of the drastic improvements she made in some of her runs, shaving off 25 seconds from her 1500 meter and eight seconds from her 800 meter, that there were questions around how she got those results, whether it was drug use or perhaps maybe even that she was not a biological female. So she actually had to undertake a sex verification test by the IAAF or the World Athletics Committee and the results were never publicly shared, but some of the information was leaked and the results stating that there might have been some intersex traits that she possessed. But in July of 2010, she was cleared to compete in women's competitions again. However, they, they got these higher levels relative to the general female population. If it was a natural process or if it was through supplementation, I do find this fascinating that they're banned outright, no question, it's unfair, there's, uh, it's unfair advantage over your competitors, yet when it comes to Laurel and our, our attempt at inclusivity, it's like, oh no, there's no advantage there, that this is okay. So with these two cases, what do you think? What's your opinion on this? Do you, do you agree that these sprinters should be banned for having nat uh, naturally high levels of testosterone, but then Laurel's allowed to compete against biological females that haven't had the benefit of 35 years of puberty, and testosterone, higher testosterone levels that were able to build that foundation to compete against. Finally, the other story that is of interest to me is that of Shikari Richardson, who is the American sprinter who had been banned or suspended for 30 days for trace amounts of cannabis being discovered in her system. Oddly enough, she won't be able to run her 100 meter sprint because that falls within the 30 day suspension, but she may be available to run the four by 100 meter relay with her team because that falls outside of the 30 day suspension. Once again, another element of this gymnastics that we're seeing where somehow it's okay within 30 days, this is not okay, but then a day or two outside of that, you can still compete and you can still do your thing. So there's a potential for that, but it seems a very arbitrary, these rules of, of being banned for this substance. Now, I fall on the idea that it's not a performance enhancing drug. I don't think cannabis is performance enhancing. Maybe it's banned because other countries still have it as an illegal substance. So to have it in your system is just, it's just easier to say no cannabis, no pot in your system because it's not legal throughout every single country or even in every single state in the United States. So perhaps that's the reason why. And so I'm not gonna be the one to judge that rule overall, but in light of it relative to these other stories, I find it fascinating because three runners have higher tes natural testosterone levels. They're banned outright. Uh, Shikari Richardson takes a little bit of pot. You're banned, but Laurel Hubbard is able to most likely dominate her female competitors, even though it's considered that she doesn't have an advantage because her testosterone levels are low enough. My opinion on this is that I don't, I don't think cannabis should be a problem. I don't think it's performance enhancing. The legality of it is more the issue, I guess. 
for the runners. I don't know why their te natural testosterone levels have spiked up, but I think re relative to the story with Laurel Hubbard, yeah, it's, it's, it's a difficult one. I think if you're going to have transgender athletes competing, it should be in a separate category. Just like you have the Paralympics for people with disabilities, you should have a separate category for transgender athletes because I, do, I personally do feel that it's an unfair advantage being able to have that previous experience, that previous history of biological development above and beyond your competitors. So let me know what you think down in the comment section below. Do you think I'm right? Do you think I'm wrong? How do you feel about this situation or these situations of, of what's considered good and bad, legal and illegal when it comes to the Olympics? I look forward to hearing your conversations down in the comment section below. And as always, I can't wait to talk to you in the next one. David out.